Well, thank you very much indeed. It's a great pleasure to be back in Dublin. We face a time when I think religion is very much on the defensive in the Western world, in every country, even here. Uh, all religion, but Christianity as well. Sometimes I think people are presumably against Islam, but want not to be thought racist, and so they just say religion, and then Christianity is also in the firing line. But there is, as our chairman mentioned, also a lot of anti-clericalism around. Uh, the French doctrine of la laïcité, the idea that public life should be secular, says it all because it says something about the importance of laïcité. Now, in other words, it's anti-clerical. And I think that's written deep into the history of France. And it influences Europe. Let me just quote from something the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly said a few years back. It sees human rights in opposition to religion rather than underwritten by it. And I think that's very much a French and to some extent Spanish attitude. Human rights are to defend people against the authoritarianism of religion, against theocracy, against oppression, against the Inquisition. Uh, that, in fact, freedom demands that we get rid of religion or at least keep it in its place. The Council of Europe, which after all includes representatives from the Republic of Ireland, the United Kingdom, uh, etc., uh, said this, States must require religious leaders to take an unambiguous stand in favour of the precedence of human rights over any religious principle. Now what I find so interesting about that is the calm assumption that somehow human rights and religious principles are opposed to each other. They have nothing to do with each other. If you're religious, you're going to be against human rights. If you believe in human rights, you've got to challenge religion. Now, as I've said, that's rooted in France. You remember that the slogan of the French Revolution was Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité. And incidentally, I don't think you can understand those words outside a Christian context, really. Um, why do we believe in freedom? Because God gave us free will. Why are we equal? Because we're equal in the sight of God. Why are we brothers and sisters? Well, that makes no sense at all unless you believe in the fatherhood of God. So these are ideas that grew out of Christian soil. People might say, oh, well, that was the background, but they're now free-floating. We don't need Christianity. Indeed, we can judge Christianity from their standpoint. But there is a different story about rights. If you look across the Atlantic to the United States, if you look at the American Declaration of Independence, you will see the statement that all men are created equal. And note the word created. They're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. In other words, rights are God-given. Rights aren't opposed to God or Christianity or religion. They depend on it. They're given to us by God. It's because of what human beings are because of how we've been made, that we need to respect human rights. And that's a view that's written deep into the American consciousness, and it makes the difference between an idea of the separation of church and state in the United States, which is certainly not the separation of religion and society, and the view of la cité in France, which is very much, we will marginalise Christianity, uh, it's a private affair. It was mentioned that uh, a subtitle of one of my books was uh, Must Faith Be Privatised? There's a great movement nowadays to, in effect, keep religion in its place. It's all right to be religious if you want to go in a building and do something funny on a Sunday morning. Don't bring it out in the street. Don't let it have anything to do with public life. You can be free. You can have freedom of religion only if it's freedom of worship. If you once come out and start saying your religion actually affects other people or that we have some insights into the common good, oh no, we mustn't allow that.
And so there is this movement to privatisation. It was very recent in the English um, Court of Appeal that uh, a judge, Lord Justice Law, said that religion is basically subjective and irrational. Uh, in other words, reason can't approach it. It isn't subject to normal standards of evidence. Uh, of course you can respect it insofar as you respect people, let them do what they want. You're not going to be stopped from playing golf if you want to go to mass, do. Uh, but that's it. Uh, it's nothing to do with anything else at all. And of course that means then that religion has nothing to do with natural rights, human rights. And that's very different from the early Enlightenment. One of the clues of, between the difference between France and the United States is that France was really influenced by the later Enlightenment, the materialists, atheists even. The United States was influenced by the philosophy of people like John Locke. And he uh, was the apostle of the Glorious Revolution in 1689 in England, uh, but a hundred years later he also was the almost patron saint of the American Revolution, the War of Independence. And there... Uh, people followed his views about toleration. And he grounded his view of natural rights in a theistic view of morality and reason. He saw that we were equal, as I've said, because God created us. Locke is sometimes seen as an empiricist, science-based philosopher. When I was an undergraduate in Oxford, that's how I viewed him. He was one of the British empiricists, Locke, Barclay, Hume. But Locke was a very committed Anglican. He was a Christian. He believed, following the Cambridge Platonists, that reason uh, wasn't free-floating, it was the candle of the Lord, it was based in God. And that meant that the rights that we see through our reason are also based in God. Well, that isn't what's happening in Europe at the moment. Uh, but the history of Europe is Christian. As I said, uh, people can say, oh, well, yes, that's a historical fact, but we don't commit the genetic fallacy just because something grew out of something doesn't mean it has anything to do with it in the sense of being justified by it. But Europe has always recognised that people have fundamental rights and freedoms as human beings rather than as members of states. When I said it always has, in its better moments it has. And in the words of an Italian philosopher and politician, Marcello Pera, this is the secular homage that Europe pays to the Christian tradition. But he now worries about an obvious intent to erase the Christian history of Europe. I expect you can remember how the idea that any reference to Christianity should occur in the preamble to the Lisbon Treaty of the European Union uh, was uh, regarded as anathema. Uh, that uh, the notion of Christianity being written into anything to do with Europe was absolutely ruled out. The famous German philosopher Jürgen Habermas also sees what he calls egalitarian universalism uh, as being the source of ideas of human rights and democracy and there the direct heir of the Judaic ethic of justice and the Christian ethic of love. Well, the result of all this is that there is a basic dispute between those who see natural rights, human rights, as anchored in our view of human beings as creatures of a creator God, and the idea of religion, in particular in Christianity and, uh, uh, as well, the idea of it as an oppressive force from which the public square has to be cleared to allow freedom to flourish. Well, what is the rational basis for a belief in human rights? Uh, I think it's terribly important that we ask that. Uh, too many so-called postmodernists are likely to talk blithely about human rights, but they don't believe in truth or reason. Uh, but they think, oh, well, this is what we believe in. But who are we and why should we believe in them? Why should we go on believing them? Why should we teach that they're important? Um, if you're not careful, you'll find that human rights just become what oh, East Coast liberal Americans happen to believe in, or something like that. It, it's a relativist view. We've got to ground it in something about what it is to be human, to justify them. We've got to be able to say to people who don't recognise human rights, you're wrong. Uh, 
this is how humans ought to be treated. That is how they ought not to be treated. I think human rights uh, lie at the root of democracy. Um, why is democracy important? It respects human rights. But you need human rights for democracy to work, for each individual to be accounted as being of equal worth. And that raises the question, why then do human beings uniquely matter? Why are human beings important? The United Nations Declaration of Human Rights says recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inviolable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice and peace in the world. Well, I, I hope that isn't going to be too controversial. But why do humans have an inherent dignity? Uh, it isn't obvious that they do. Uh, the world is full of people who believe that they don't. And uh, uh, there are plenty of regimes that care nothing for human rights. Um, even the Chinese, I think, would say they're just a Western construction, a bit of Western ideology. They don't believe in human rights. They just uh, regard them as a bit of rhetoric that the West uses to bludgeon them with. But I think they're much more important than that. They're pointing to something that's true about human beings. Well, why do human beings have inherent dignity? Why is it that what matters to each human being is important? One philosopher, James Griffin from Oxford, stresses that our dignity lies in our capacity to choose and to pursue our conception of a worthwhile life. In other words, it resides in capacities, what we're able to do. I'm not going to get too involved in philosophy, but uh, that's a particularly Kantian view about philosophy. It's like his stress on rationality. Human beings are important because they're rational. Well, all right, that's important enough, but um, it makes choice, consent, autonomy of central importance. They're all things that liberals think terribly important. What happens to people I think we would regard as human who aren't in a position to make choices to give consent, exercise autonomy? What about people suffering from Alzheimer's? What about small children, babies? What about humans who uh, are always um, going to be in some way unable to exercise true human capacities for whatever reason? It's very tragic, but are we going to say they don't matter? Now, if you're saying rationality matters, choice matters, the ability to pursue our conception of a worthwhile life matters, people who aren't in that position anymore, well, are they not human? Don't they have rights? Do they have no dignity? Well, I would say that actually that isn't doing justice to the idea of human rights that actually we think that humans matter because they're human. And I think this drives us back to the notion that the reason that humans matter is because we are loved by God. If you want to pursue it in a Christian doctrinal way, you can say the incarnation, God becoming human, shows how he regards human beings. Now, one point about human rights as well that I think is very well worth bearing in mind is that they are, if they exist, if they are supposed to matter, they are objectively true. In other words, it isn't just that human rights are, are what I believe in because I believe in them. As I was saying, they're not just important because we think they're important. They're important because we see they're important. We're important because we recognise they're important. In other words, they're objectively true. And again, this begins to raise uh, issues about the objective truth of morality. Uh, a very unpopular view, I mean, whenever I deal with students, they take it for granted that uh, morality is a subjective or social matter. They'll say, well, that's just your opinion. Um, as if to say, you can't tell me what's right, it's for me to judge. It's what's right for me, it may not be right for you. Well, human rights aren't like that. Uh, if you go to, I don't know, Zimbabwe and uh, saw the way that Mugabe might want to treat people, uh, the fact that he doesn't think that human rights matters uh, would be sufficient in this view. Well, they might be true for us, but they're not true for him. 
but I would want to criticise what he might be doing or what other uh, people, perhaps even worse, might be doing. So you can't be a relativist about morality and believe in human rights. Uh, you have to be an objectivist. Now that's of great importance because uh, I think a lot of people don't really necessarily um, take that on board. You'll find that a, a lot of even continental philosophers will talk blithely about human rights when they don't really believe even that there is such a thing as being human, let alone that there is such a thing as there being objectively a right. But it may very well be that, and I only just put this forward as a, a question, that an objective morality in the end only makes sense within a theistic framework. Perhaps the reason why relativism is so popular nowadays is just that religion has lost its grip and people don't see how they can root any moral view in anything because they don't think ultimately there is any wider truth built into the scheme of things. Let's put it round the other way. If you believe in human rights, and a lot of people, a lot of good people who aren't religious do, if you believe in them and believe that humans matter and there are some ways you shouldn't treat human beings, perhaps that itself in the end might be an argument for theism, because if only theism can ground human rights and you think they are important and need grounding, you may be pointed in that direction. Certainly a Christian view of the issue comes from the American philosopher Nicholas Waterstorff. He claims that being loved by God gives a human being great worth, a point I've already touched on. He says, natural human rights are what respect for that worth requires. He worries that if our Judaic and Christian heritage of a belief in our equal and great worth erodes, then, ominously he says, we must expect that our moral subculture of rights will also eventually erode. In other words, if I'm right in saying that ultimately human rights depend on Christianity and Christianity's grip on the Western imagination is lost, how much longer, how many generations will it be before we stop really believing in human rights? I think you can already begin to see that with, uh, in fact, things like euthanasia, uh, assisted suicide coming to the fore, the idea that actually, in the end, being human isn't perhaps the only thing that matters. Pain, suffering, perhaps are more important. People might be expendable. And that is, I think, the beginning of a long and slippery slope to goodness knows where. Human rights can be undermined if Christian belief is lost, and Christianity doesn't just shape human rights, it grounds them and justifies them. Now, I want particularly to talk about one human right that I think is of particular importance, and that's the right to freedom of religious belief and practice. It is a central element of human rights. Uh, there are plenty of people, and again it's all part of the general campaign against religion nowadays, who would want to say actually we don't need to talk about freedom of religion anymore. Uh, they don't want actually to say that people who are religious can't practice their religion. They realise that's going a bit far. But they can say, look, we can let them do what they want without actually talking about religion. We can talk about freedom of conscience, freedom of assembly, etc. Freedom of speech. Um, we don't need to protect religion as such. We don't need to say religion is of importance in society. Well, I think religion is of particular importance in society. It's very deeply rooted in human nature. And uh, one particular problem of religion is that it posits a centre of authority which opposes that of the state, or at least is different from that of the state, the state even being the will of the people in a democratic environment, too. Um, if the majority thinks something, actually you might find some Christians object to that, and the majority may not like that. So uh, you'll find that religion is always claiming a different place to stand from where a lot of people want to stand, or from where the state wishes to stand. As a result, it's always going to be in the firing line. You'll notice that totalitarian states always want to uh, control religion or eliminate it. Uh, 
in communist China, for instance. Uh, the great aim of the state is always to keep the churches under control, to have them as patriotic churches with the bishops appointed by the state, not the Vatican, etc. Uh, because they don't want the church positing a different source of authority. So there are reasons for protecting religion. In the United States, uh, Americans are inclined to say freedom of religion is the first freedom. Now they say that because it's mentioned first in the First Amendment to the Constitution. But they think it's more important than that. They think it's their first because the founders, people like James Madison, thought that from freedom of religion everything follows. You can't live in a democratic society unless you're free to practice and speak about what you think most important, and by definition that's going to be religion. If you're not free to adopt a religious belief and live by it, you aren't really in a free society, you can't really contribute to democratic debate. And that means in the end that even our commitment to human rights will then be at risk. Now, uh, let me just say for a few minutes that I think that this freedom of religion uh, can be very misunderstood. A lot of people on the continent, and this is going back to what I was saying earlier about the different sources of uh, enlightenment views about freedom and about rights, a lot of people on the continent would see freedom of religion as important as a way of guarding against interference from the church or against a kind of theocracy, authoritarianism of the church. Again, it's the anti-clericalism coming up. In other words, it's freedom of religion is, is freedom from religion, not freedom for religion. And they would see that actually freedom of religion, therefore, is something that comes in to loosen the shackles of tradition, the ancien regime, um, the hidebound views of uh, traditional religion, and to let people reason for themselves. And the, the idea there, really, then, is that religious freedom not just doesn't have anything to do with Christianity, but you need it to resist Christianity. Now, I think that's a fundamental misunderstanding of religious freedom. I think it is rooted in Christianity. Now, uh, of course, you can look through the history of the church and the history of relations of the church and the state in many countries and see that sometimes things haven't worked out like that. There's been too often a, a, an unholy alliance, and really an unholy one, between church and state, where the church has been harnessed very often to the interests of the state, even of dictatorships. But it shouldn't be like that. And Christianity, after all, was born demanding religious freedom. Early Christians were faced with the necessity of proving their loyalty to the Roman emperor. And in a society of many beliefs, they refused to take part in the formal ceremonies of the civil religion and often face martyrdom. But they themselves in their lives exemplified the need for freedom of conscience, the freedom to recognize the separate authority of God. So, uh, from the beginning, I think that uh, Christianity has recognized the importance of freedom. But if you look back, at where modern ideas of democracy and religious freedom and the two are closely linked, where they came from, uh, I think you can see that they are rooted in particular Christian views about uh, the whole uh, nature of human beings and their relationship of, with God. Last year was the 400th anniversary of the publication of, I think, the first book advocating religious freedom in England. It was by an early Baptist called Thomas Helwys. He wrote a treatise upholding the idea of religious liberty. It was just a year after the publication of the authorised version of the Bible approved by King James. And Thomas Helwys rather unwisely sent a copy personally of his book to the king, and he inscribed in it the view in his own hand that if the king has authority to make spiritual lords and lords, he's an immortal god, not a mortal man. And the king wasn't particularly impressed with this, and Helwys ended his days in Newgate Prison in London. Now, uh, you might say, well, that was the end of that, but actually these views planted a seed that grew, and these were the first ideas of religious freedom, of freedom of conscience, 
of not just conforming necessarily to what the state demanded. Helwys's own arguments had a powerful influence, which were to echo on through the years. Uh, Roger Williams, the founder of Rhode Island in the United States, and a somewhat extreme supporter of religious freedom, was as a boy living only a few hundred yards from Newgate Prison, and he would have, I think, been well aware of Thomas Helwys. And I think you could argue that Helwys's view has actually exercised an indirect influence on people such as John Locke. Now, what did Helwys say that was to strike such an important note for subsequent history? His arguments were theological. Religious freedom was based in a theistic view, as when he asks the king whether it isn't most equal that men should choose their religion themselves, because they only must stand themselves before the judgment seat of God to answer for themselves. A very deep thought that if we each have to stand before the judgment seat of God, we must make our own decisions, we must make our own commitments. And that thought was taken up, in fact, by John Locke, who said that faith only and inward sincerity are the things that procure acceptance with God, a thought that again was taken up later by Thomas Jefferson and influenced the United States Constitution. Helwys also drew a distinction between an earthly kingdom, subject to the king, and a heavenly kingdom over which the king could have no jurisdiction. The king could rule over people's bodies and goods, but not over the spirits of his people. This was the thesis of two kingdoms, which influenced much Protestant thinking. Uh, it's not a thesis, actually, that I myself am happy about, because you can immediately see where this is going. Uh, spiritual things are your own affair. Anything in public is the state's. Um, then religion must be driven out of public life. And you can almost see this in the European Convention of Human Rights, where there is a clear distinction between personal belief, which is an absolute right, you can't be stopped from believing what you wish, and the qualified right to manifest your beliefs. Now, I don't think a qualified right to manifest your beliefs is worth all that much. A totalitarian state, I think, would be quite happy for people to believe what they wanted as long as they never said anything about it, acted on it, or let it affect anything they did. In fact, I think that was probably often the situation in communist uh, Eastern Europe. Christianity can't be split in this way between personal private belief and what's manifested in public or bodily form. So to go down that route talking about freedom is, I think, wrong. Freedom should cover everything, all parts of religion. But however crucial the claim that the state shouldn't encroach on people's response to God, I think, as I've said, the withdrawal of religion from and Christianity in particular, into a protected private sphere, but no influence on the public one, is a denial of much that Christianity should stand for. I mean, the Lord's Prayer says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And his will isn't just that we have the right beliefs inside us, it's that the world, in fact, be transformed, that God's kingdom come. I just want to mention, though, one problem about all of this. For all Helwys's personal courage, um, he was, I think, very akin, very uh, ready to criticise everybody. He fell out with everybody. Not just Roman Catholics, you'd expect that. Not just proud Anglican prelates, you'd expect that. Also Puritans, and also separatists. In fact, just about everybody. I mean, Presbyterians, Congregations, even his fellow Baptists. Indeed, I think he's a very good illustration, as was Roger Williams later, of the fact that unless you're prepared to compromise and listen to other people and reason with them, you're going to be left in a church of one person. And, that, uh, and this, I think, shows that the great tug between personal conscience on the one hand and claims to truth on another. And it's that safeguarding of objective truth, which I've said is terribly important for talking about human rights. Without objective truth, there are no human rights. But it's that that brings the church into disrepute sometimes, all churches. Because it can seem to be an attack on personal freedom, can't it? If I'm told what I should believe because it's true or because it's right, then I'm being told to conform to something outside myself. And... Before long, people start talking about the Inquisition. 
And uh, that was always a, a terrible example, even in the 18th century and even in the 18th century United States. But the Inquisition's intention was to preserve truth, uh, but the result was an appalling coercion that I would have thought contradicts any idea that Christianity demands a free response to a loving God. And I think I'll just leave you then with this question, then how can one reconcile the demands of this freely chosen subjective commitment and the role of an objective truth held in common? And I think one answer to that is just an appeal to reason. <coughs> the freedom which heroist demands be seen as a gift of God has to be respected as such. We all have rights, and our freedom is one of the most precious rights of all. But with it comes the gift of reason. The very fact that we must recognise each other's rights shows that we are in the business of reasoning together. We don't each make up our minds in isolation, but can share in reasoning about what's true. Without freedom, we can't properly judge the truth for ourselves, but without the ballast of shared reason, we'll each flounder in a morass of subjective opinion. Um, now, unfortunately, of course, if you go too far in just not listening to other people, you get into the situation that some followers of Thomas Helwys got into, which was namely the English Civil War. Um, of course, this again um, is one of the things in the history of Europe that turns people against religion. They think religion sets people against each other. It causes disharmony. Uh, it doesn't bring people together. And that's, of course, the reverse of what Christianity should be doing. So, certainly freedom is important. But freedom without reason is dangerous. And reason without freedom is impotent. Thank you very much.